Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 18th annual Academic Debates in Illinois. We are excited about our topics, proud of our teams, grateful to our sponsors, and honored to have such an outstanding panel of judges alongside our esteemed moderator. We are grateful that you would take time out of your busy schedule to join us and hope you enjoyed the evening. As a reminder, ALF has many resources for the liver patient, including a helpline, and we offer exceptional educational programs to our healthcare professionals. We encourage you to visit the links on this slide to explore all that we have to offer, and please encourage your patients to visit us too. We help connect the liver community through Cuisine for a Cause, being hosted this Saturday and the Liver Life Walk coast to coast on June 5th. Follow the link in the chat for details of all of our upcoming events and programs. Please use our social media throughout the evening to share your thoughts with your friends, family, and colleagues about the debates. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. This academic debate is being delivered on the Zoom webinar platform and will be recorded. During the presentations, if you have a question, please hover your mouse over the bottom of your screen and click on Q&A. Then simply type your question into the Q&A box. For all other comments and to cheer on your favorite team, please use the Q&A as well. Again, please note that we are recording this program and there is a disclaimer in the chat box. As I mentioned earlier, we are extremely grateful for our sponsors. Our national sponsors are supporting the debates across the nation and our local sponsors are supporting us solely in our efforts in Illinois. Our national sponsors include national gold sponsors, Abby and ASI. Our na silver national sponsor is Salix, and our national bronze sponsors are Alexion, Mellencrot, and Pfizer. Our local gold sponsor for the evening is Exalexis, and our local silver sponsors are Genentech and Gilead. We are so appreciative of their support. We encourage you to thank them when you visit with them Without their support, we would not be able to continue to fulfill our mission. I wanted to give a shout out to ALF's engagement team. Our role is to work with local leaders across the US so we can maintain the unique voice of our local communities and develop initiatives that address their specific needs. I am thrilled to work closely with Kathy Flynn, Gina Bartas, Sherry Singer, and Kat Evans. A special shout out to Kat Evans, whose expertise with virtual platforms has allowed us to continue to host the debates and other programs. Tonight, she is assisted by Karen Irwin. Thank you, Kat and Karen. And it is now time to hear from two people who really don't need an introduction. They are very respected members of the Illinois medical community and beyond and they currently serve as co-chairs of the ALF Illinois Medical Advisory Council. Please welcome Dr. Sheila Swarren, who will be saying a few words about the history and format of tonight's program, followed by Dr. Bashar Attar, who will explain the trophy competition, the audience polls, and introduce our moderator for the evening. Hi, thank you, Jackie. My name is Sheila S. Warren. I'm one of the hepatologists at Rush University Medical Center. Can you believe that it has been 18 years that we have been doing the Illinois debate? Personally, this evening always has a special place in my heart. I have actually sat in every seat in the, this room, well, this virtual room. I've presented as a fellow. I've been a mentor. I've been on the winning side and the losing side. I have, um, although there are no losers, right? They're, you're all winners in my heart. Um, and I've been a judge, I've been in the audience rooting on my colleagues. I've 
Um, now, as the co-chair of the Medical Advisory Committee, it's really my honor to be here uh, to say a few words about how this evening will go. The Illinois Debates have, has really become a signature healthcare education program that's been recognized by the National American Liver Foundation and the AASLD. As you all know, every year the hospitals of Chicago come together for some friendly competition. And as usual, uh, one Chicago team sits out. So this year, the University of Chicago has a bye. So we want to welcome our traveling team, Dr. Oliveira and his team from the University of Nebraska, my alma mater. The topics and teams have been selected by the American Liver Foundation, Illinois, Medical Advisory Council. So if you have any uh, feedback or complaints that you can talk to myself and Dr. Bashar Attar as we are co-chairs. Uh, we have six debate teams of young investigators mentored by senior investigators, and they've put a lot of hard work into their presentations. Tonight's topic, topics do not have a right or wrong answer. The debaters will be judged on criteria such as research and presentation skills by an outstanding panel of judges that will be introduced. Each presentation will be closely timed and the winners will be announced at the end of the evening. We would like to acknowledge the hard work of all of our teams and express our appreciation for our community partners, judges, timekeepers, and all of our volunteers. A special thanks to Jackie, Kat, and Karen for all their help and support throughout the year and tonight. As, and just as importantly, thank you all for joining us. I want to um, acknowledge the members of the Illinois Medical Advisory Council listed here and all the members of the um, Associate Medical Advisory Committee listed here. Now it's really my pleasure to hand over the program to the American, my co-chair of the ALF Illinois MAC, Dr. Bashar Attar, thank you. Okay, I wanna welcome everybody to the academic debates and thank you Sheila for introducing me and uh, welcome all members. And I wanna thank uh, in particular Jackie and Kat and Karen for making this successful. And um, as Sheila mentioned, I'm the co-chair of the Medical Advisory Committee for the Lake Division chapter uh, division. Uh, once again, I wanna thank all the sponsors and as you know, we have each year a competition called the Liver Cup. And this competition is usually help us in raising funds to continue to deliver outstanding programs like the liver debates or the liver academic debates. I want to remind everyone to be as generous as possible tonight and help us um, in having a favorite team that will be able to get this trophy. The team that receives the highest donations will be able to have this, to display this uh, trophy proudly for the year 2021. This liver cup, uh, who's gonna be having it this year? Uh, we're gonna see and watch uh, for the end of the evening who will be able really to get it. Uh, please click uh, on the link in the chat and make your donations to your favorite team at any time during this program. And you could see here the fundraising competition already started. Uh, before introducing uh, our amazing uh, moderator, I want to mention that we will conduct an audience polling. And this uh, polling will be throughout the evening Questions will be posted in the chat periodically and we are hoping you will be taking a moment to respond. The poll results will be shared in a following up email, but with the exception of the last poll. The last poll, the audience will be requested to select a team that they felt is the best for tonight. And we will share the, at the end of the program along with the winners of each debate uh, topics, those winners, and also the ones that selected by the audience. And now it is, I'm thrilled and it is my great pleasure to introduce our esteemed moderator for the evening, Dr. Tamar Tadi. Dr. Tamar Tadi is the co-chair of the ALF's National Medical Advisory Council. She's Associate Professor of Medicine at Yale School of Medicine 
and her clinical and research interests include cirrhosis, liver cancer, and liver transplantation. She directs local and national outcome and quality improvement projects in the VA healthcare system. Dr. Taddy has been recognized with teaching awards for her commitment and dedication to the education of medical students, residents, and fellows. She's an associate director for the medical scientist training program at Yale. On a personal note, I was very impressed with her excellent session she chaired on clinical hepatology debrief during the ASLD liver meeting last November. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Taddy and good luck to all the participant teams. Tamar. Thank you so much, Dr. Attar, for that introduction. Welcome everybody. Um, it's really an honor to be here tonight to moderate. Um, you know, Chicago and Illinois in general, the debates, you have set the uh, standard for the nation. Um, so big shout out to uh, your great state and also to Jackie, who really was the pioneer of, of the debates. As many of you may know, the American Liver Foundation is celebrating its 45th year. And despite the pandemic and due to the resilience of ALF staff, our stakeholders, local leadership and our partners, we stand strong in our commitment to provide resources to the liver community. Resources far exceed the excellent literature and information on the website. Virtually, ALF continues to provide opportunities to unite the liver community through events such as the walks, marathons, cuisine for a cause, and patient and healthcare professional education programs. There has been significant increase in callers to the ALF helpline and visits to the website, proving the relevancy of our information and services. We take a leadership role in advocating on behalf of the millions of Americans <clears throat> living with liver disease, and Advocacy Week is May 10th to 14th. You're invited to join our national ALF leadership in virtual sessions with legislators in Washington, DC. ALF's fundraising dollars are reinvested in mission delivery including funding for scientific research in the field of liver diseases. Visit the website, www.liverfoundation.org for details. <clears throat> so judging for tonight's debates is performed by our esteemed panel of judges from various medical institutions across Illinois and Wisconsin. Before I introduce the judges, I'd like to remind everyone that the debaters will be judged on presentation, knowledge, ability to think on their feet. There are no right or wrong answers in these ethical debate topics. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce the judges. But before I introduce the judges, I want all of the presenters tonight to understand that you're actually the reason that we come to work every day. You're the next generation. And you know your hard work tonight just shows that you know what we do is worth doing, right? So I think it's really important to recognize everyone who prepared tonight, because we know you're busy, we know you're seeing patients, we know you have a lot on your plate, and thank you for your hard work tonight. So the judges for the first and third debates are Dr. Veronica Loy of the Medical College of Wisconsin, Dr. Anjana Pillai of the University of Chicago, and also a member of the ALF Illinois Medical Advisory Council, Dr. Rockford Yap. Amita Health, Good Samaritan, and also a member of the ALF Illinois Medical Advisory Council. For the second presentation, the second debate, there are three judges, Dr. Klaus Fimmel, North Shore University Health System, Dr. David Kim of the Illinois Gastroenterology Group, and Dr. Kavitha Singh of Swedish Covenant Hospital. As mentioned by Dr. Eswaran, this pro program is strictly timed. So each pre presenter will have eight minutes to present and each rebuttal will receive five minutes. Debaters will receive timing notifications from our timekeepers throughout their remarks. If the time limit is exceeded, then their mic will be muted. So you are not having technical difficulties. It's pretty rough, but we're gonna cut you off. Q&A will be conducted by our judging panel, and you're encouraged to include any question you might have in the question box, not the chat. I also want to remind everyone to use social media throughout the evening and follow the debate's Twitter feed through the program at, at ALF Debates. 
So you should have a poll up here right now. And I'm going to go ahead and present the, or introduce the first debate. So debate number one, presence and severity of metabolic syndrome is a central risk factor for hepatic steatosis. Therefore, patients with NASH should be evaluated and treated for metabolic comorbidities. Who is responsible? Loyola University Medical Center will present the pro side. This is the responsibility of the primary care physician. University of Nebraska Medical Center will present the con side. This is the responsibility of the gastroenterology, hepatology, NAFLD subspecialist. So, presenting the pro position is Loyola University Medical Center. Loyola University will argue that this is the responsibility of the primary care physician. Presenting tonight are Drs. Jasleen Singh and Dr. Judy True. Their mentor is Dr. Jonah Rubin. And the con physician is being presented by the University of Nebraska Medical Center, our traveling team. And they will be arguing that this is the responsibility of the gastroenterology, hepatology, NAPLD subspecialist. Their mentor is Dr. Marco Oliveira, and the fellows presenting the University of Nebraska Medical Center are Dr. Patrick Tuhig and Dr. Natalie Corey. All right, so Dr. Jasleen Singh from Loyola will now present the pro position. I'm going to let her load up her slides, and once they are loaded, I'm going to ask the timekeeper, are you ready? And let's begin. Good evening, everyone. I am Jasleen Singh, a third-year GI fellow at Loyola University. I will be spending the next eight minutes of your time convincing you why the primary care provider should be responsible for evaluating and treating the metabolic comorbidities in patients with NASH. The question being asked is about treating the medical comorbidities, not treating NASH itself. The prevalence of metabolic syndrome has increased more than 35% over the past two decades. As such, NASH, as the hepatic manifestation of metabolic disease, has now become the most common chronic liver disease and the most rapidly increasing indication for liver transplant. Given the high prevalence of metabolic syndrome in patients with NASH, it is of utmost importance to address the various facets of the disease. The role of the hep hepatologist is to diagnose and stage the patient's disease, while the primary care provider manages the comorbidities of metabolic syndrome. First, primary care improves outcomes in patients with multiple comorbidities, including multidisciplinary teams led by a primary care provider. In one study from 2017, a team of providers led by a family physician, including a dietitian and kinesiologist, resulted in reversal of metabolic syndrome in 19% of patients, improvement in healthy eating habits, and decrease in 10-year risk of acute coronary events from 8.6 to 1.4%. Another study from 2012 demonstrated that patients with diabetes who were managed by primary care had better glycemic control than those diabetic patients managed outside of primary care. Primary care providers are the quarterbacks for patients, especially those who have multiple conditions that need to be managed. Furthermore, studies have also shown that primary care is associated with lower overall mortality, which is of great significance in the NASH population whose leading cause of death is not liver disease, but is in fact cardiovascular causes. Primary care is more effective in managing NASH-related diseases and decreasing risk factors for these conditions. The metabolic syndrome is complex and encompasses multiple organ systems. In fact, the majority of NASH-related comorbidities are identified on routine screening in the primary care setting. In a study published in Hepatology in 2018, 46% of overall outpatient visits were to primary care five years after diagnosis of NASH, as shown by the red boxes here. PCPs are clearly seeing these patients more often than subspecialists, 
and therefore would be most effective in treating the metabolic syndrome. Additionally, primary care providers are best suited and trained to evaluate and manage these multiple conditions, all of which interact with each other. There are many different classes of medications used for diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. Even in just the last few years, several more classes of medications have emerged to treat the manifestations of metabolic syndrome. This algorithm from the American Diabetes Association highlights just how complicated treatment of diabetes can become when taking into account cardiovascular risk and chronic kidney disease. Simply put, primary care is more experienced and knowledgeable regarding treatment of these conditions when diseases such as hypertension and diabetes are in the top 10 reasons for primary care visits. The overall goal of metabolic syndrome, including NASH, is one thing, reduction in cardiovascular death. The primary care provider who has a broader and more complete view of the patient can ensure appropriate management of these disease processes to reduce the risk of cardiovascular death. In fact, primary care has demonstrated the ability of implementing simple measures to address the metabolic syndrome. Randomized control trials have demonstrated that primary care-based interventions such as dietary education, self-monitoring, and inter inter motivational interviewing can lead to weight loss and cardiovascular risk reduction. The primary care provider is the main point of contact for patients. And if they are not the ones managing the central disease process, in this case, metabolic syndrome, then care may be fragmented and thus create confusion for the patients, hindering overall care. Finally, resources are limited. Utilization of primary care resources is associated with lower healthcare expenditures. One study published in 1998 found that annual healthcare costs in patients with primary care providers amounted to a mean of $2,029 as compared to $3,100 in patients without a primary care physician. This may be related to fewer advanced tests and procedures that subspecialists are more inclined to order. Additionally, reimbursement and co-pays are higher for subspecialists, which may then also be a deterrent for some patients who may not have the resources to pay for these visits. For this reason, primary care can improve access to healthcare by ensuring management of patients with multiple medical conditions, rather than referring them to a specialist unless necessary. Patients may have a hard time paying co-pays to see multiple providers, so this is a major reason for primary care providers to be actively managing and evaluating the entities of metabolic syndrome. The financial aspect of this argument is important to consider when the total annual cost for patients with metabolic syndrome is over $2,000 more than patients without metabolic syndrome. An even more important consideration is that patients with NASH have higher cost expenditures than those with similar metabolic comorbidities, but without NASH. Given the costs associated with a liver disease diagnosis, it is of utmost importance to decrease the cost of the other metabolic manifestations. Time is also a valuable resource in healthcare. NASH is just one manifestation of the metabolic syndrome, and this is on the rise. Patients need their liver disease staged by a hepatologist. Therefore, it is not practical for the hepatologist to address metabolic syndrome comorbidities in a clinic visit. The focus, again, needs to be on NASH and staging the fibrosis. When taking into context that NASH is just one of several liver conditions that warrant specialty evaluation, time as a resource becomes even more important. In summary, primary care is the quarterback for the patient, the cornerstone of diagnosing and managing the metabolic syndrome. Primary care improves outcomes such as weight loss and uh, reduction in cardiovascular risk by implementing measures such as multidisciplinary teams and programs focused on weight loss and glycemic control. This is especially important when considering cardiovascular mortality is the leading cause of death in patients with NASH. Lastly, in this day and age, healthcare costs carry considerable weight in utilization of primary care resources can decrease overall expenditures. With that, I leave you with this one final question. Would you rather have your hepatologist managing diabetic medications she has never heard of or a primary care provider who routinely prescribes them? 
After all, the University of Nebraska should know the importance of primary care. Thank you. Dr. Patrick Tuhig from University of Nebraska will now provide the con presentation. We'll wait for you to load up your slides and then the timekeeper, once you're loaded and begin speaking, will start to time you. Timekeeper ready? You may begin. Good evening, everyone. Why hepatologists? Through this talk, I'll discuss through the epidemiology, natural history, diagnosis, and staging, as well as treatment and surveillance as to why our specialty is essential in the management of NASH and NAFLIC patients. Cirrhosis is the number nine leading cause of death in the United States, and NAFLD is the number one chronic liver disease worldwide. It's also currently the number two reason for liver transplant in the US. In the United States, 35% of the population has NAFLD and 12% has NASH. Among patients with type 2 diabetes, that number is greater than 50%. An important consideration in, in discussing this topic is that patients with lean NAFLD make up 15% of the U.S. population, and these are individuals who do not fit a typical metabolic syndrome profile. A survey of providers outside of GI and hepatology predicted that the overall prevalence of NAFLD in the United States was less than 10%, which grossly underestimates the high prevalence of this essential disease. The natural history of NAFLD is highly variable, as some patients will progress to NASH over a six-year period, whereas others will progress one stage every seven years. Again, 20% will have rapid progression in five years, but what we're seeing now is that individuals with fatty liver disease who are not at advanced stages of fibrosis are developing complications such as hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, both at low stages of fibrosis as well as F3. Unfortunately, less than 20% of fatty liver disease patients are referred to hepatologists, including less than 5% of those with F3 to 4 fibrosis. And this late stage of diagnosis and referral has been shown to lead to poorer outcomes. NAFLD is defined as steatosis without inflammation or disturbance in liver function by ruling out all secondary causes that may cause fatty liver. One of the difficulties in doing this secondary evaluation is there are often discordant results, including elevated ferritin in these patients, as well as positive autoimmune serology. What do we do with these discordant results? This is where hepatologists can be very helpful in helping clarify what the etiology of fatty liver disease is. NASH is fatty liver with inflammation and or disturbance in liver function which must be diagnosed by a biopsy, which can both be performed and interpreted by a hepatologist. Only 20% of patients with an AFLD carry this diagnosis in primary care, and there's also been shown to be an inconsistency in evaluating for alternative or secondary causes of liver disease. As mentioned, liver biopsy is the gold standard for diagnosing NAFLD and NASH, and this can be both performed and interpreted by a hepatologist. Currently, the AASLD recommends considering biopsy in a wide array of circumstances, including in those who have features of metabolic syndrome over the age of 55. Currently, many patients with fatty liver disease are evaluated because of abnormal LFTs, but this is a very low sensitivity screening test, as many patients with metabolic syndrome actually have normal LFTs. Currently, serum markers such as the FIB4 index and NAFLD fibrosis score may be effective at including or excluding fibrosis, but they're less specific for staging. These tests also have low reliability in certain subsets of the population, and were also developed with a small number of patients and no validation cohort. When initiating treatment, lifestyle interventions are the foundation of NAFLD management. However, this only carries a 20% success rate. Additionally, 14% of NAFL patients are counseled about diet and exercise in primary care, which is a major gap. Initiating medications for NAFL can only be performed or can only be done after a liver biopsy is performed. Rapid weight loss in these patients has also been shown to increase fatty oxidation and accelerate the progression of NASH. There are currently many medications in the pipeline for NASH and NAFL at different phases of clinical trials. Hepatologists are going to be best suited to assess patients' eligibility for enrolling in these trials. Additionally, they also understand the pathophysiologic mechanisms of the medications that are being tested, 
maintaining knowledge of the recent trials and medications that are available for fatty liver disease and enrolling the appropriate patients for different medications based on medical comorbidities. There's currently no society recommended surveillance strategy for NASH and NAFLD. This is where hepatologists can risk stratify patients and provide an individualized surveillance strategy given the highly variable natural history and progression of this disease. As shown in this algorithm, patients with lower stages of fibrosis can be considered for clinical trials or initiation of FDA approved medical therapies and provided an individualized surveillance strategy based on personal and medical factors. In those with more advanced stages of fibrosis, again, consideration for clinical trials can be done, but also close monitoring for decompensation of liver disease and early transplant evaluation can be performed. 20% of patients with NASH develop cirrhosis and 45% of those patients will decompensate. But how do we define decompensation? Is it clinical symptoms? Is it the MELD score, the child PU score, the NFS, the FIP4, the APRI? There are many factors to consider and this is gonna be best done by a hepatologist to not only provide that identification, but also drive surveillance and manage complications. A proposed algorithm of care is highlighted in this, in this slide, all of which can be performed by a hepatologist by identifying patients who have risk factors for fatty liver disease and providing structured lifestyle interventions for managing and achieving weight loss, performing a comprehensive evaluation for secondary causes of fatty liver disease, and if discordance exists, performing a liver biopsy. Once an appropriate stage of fibrosis has been achieved, patients can then be considered for medical therapy, clinical trials, and be surveyed while also managing comorbidities and uh, providing healthcare maintenance and vaccinations for patients with liver disease. And in those with cirrhosis, monitoring for decompensation, considering enrolling in clinical trials and early evaluation for transplant can be performed. In conclusion, early referral to hepatologists is critical for not only staging disease and stratifying risk, but also determining eligibility for treatment, enrolling in clinical trials, monitoring disease progression, and identifying early decompensation for transplant eligibility, as well as educating our colleagues in primary care on tools that can be used to identify at-risk patients. Here are my references. Thank you very much. Okay. So we've heard from both teams. It's now time for the rebuttal phase. So Dr. Natalie Corey from the University of Nebraska will now rebut the pro position. Okay. Good evening. Um, in response to what Dr. Singh has just mentioned, I'm gonna argue without any disrespect to PCTs that actually their current state of knowledge regarding NAFLD and its comorbidities as well uh, is uh, subpar and this is leading to inadequate quality of care for our NAFLD patients despite what she has you believe in uh, real life. First of all, when it comes to NAFLD comorbidities, they are being underdiagnosed and undertreated uh, by PCTs. She mentioned the American Diabetes Association well, according to the ADA, about 20% of patients with diabetes are undiagnosed, and they noted in their study that PCPs are actually not adhering to the ADA guidelines when it comes to um, diabetes screening. When patients are being screened um, and diagnosed with pre-diabetes, they are less than 40% of cases getting the appropriate lifestyle um, modification counseling that is needed. A shocking number in one survey, about 8% of PCPs only knew that 7% of body weight uh, was the minimum weight loss needed for patients with pre-diabetes. You can make the correlation that they also don't know what is the ideal weight goal uh, loss needed for patients with with NAFLD. Patients who have diabetes in one study, um, uh, they have not had through their PCP an A1C in the last 12 months in up to 40% of cases. And um, less than one third of them actually achieve an A1C of less than 7% in the PCP setting. Um, they are also patients who have diabetes and uh, obesity. We know they are at risk for advanced liver fibrosis and HCC, and um, only 46% of them are getting screened for NAFLD in the PCP setting, and that's just a very low number. 
Um, same thing can be said for hyperlipidemia. About 20% of patients are not diagnosed in the PCP setting. Patients who have hyperlipidemia in about 50% of cases have not had a lipid panel um, tested uh, in the past 12 months by their PCP. Only 25% of patients who actually meet criteria to be on a statin are prescribed a statin by PCP. Worst, if someone has hyperlipidemia and is on statin and then is um, diagnosed with NAFLD by their PCP, there's a 40% chance that the PCP is going to stop that statin for no obvious reason. So they're not doing a great job in that regard. Um, numbers are even worse for sleep apnea. The uh, American Academy of Sleep Medicine mentions that about 89% of sleep apnea is not diagnosed uh, in, the P in the PCP setting. Only 25% of PCP chart mentioned any sleep history um, taken by the PCP. So even though they know about the metabolic syndrome, they are not doing a good job in screening, diagnosing, or treating. Um, Dr. Singh mentioned that a hepatologist may lack time to take care of that. So do PCP is clearly, since they're not doing a good job about it, their panel um, accounts for about 2,000 patients. So if they're going to take care of all of that, they'll be working more than 50 hours a week. Um, Dr. Singh mentioned that we do not prescribe these um, meds uh, routinely. Well, they're not doing a good job prescribing them routinely either. And what is routine? Routine is when you do something um, on a regular basis. We can do the same and we are equipped to do the, to do the same. Um, Dr. Singh mentioned that um, PCPs have a lower cost when it comes to natural management and its comorbidities. That is short-sighted because, yes, they may be more cost-effective in the short run, but they are costing more money in the long run since um, poor management is leading to eventually complications, including cirrhosis and HCC. And when you factor that in, the cost of HCC and liver transplant, hepatologists do a better job in saving money in the long run. Um, to say that treating, this is about treating comorbidities and not treating um, NAFL, that's just uh, dissociative care. They should go hand in hand. 50% um, of patients did not know the difference between NASH and NAFLD, and that is scary because that means you don't know uh, how to treat. They are less likely to prescribe bariatric surgery, to prescribe vitamin E, and to enroll patients in clinical trial, not to mention the statin. So I will not be comfortable being in the back seat uh, when managing NAFLD and comorbidities. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> I think the gauntlet's been uh, thrown down. So we now will have Judy True from the Loyola University who will rebut the con position. Dr. True? Our colleagues at the University of Nebraska make a sound argument for hepatologists to manage metabolic comorbidities. However, there are a few counterpoints that we would like to address. The first counterpoint was the underestimation of NAFLD amongst PCPs. Now, the prompt is that, um, that we are asking the PCPs to manage the NASH-related comorbidities, not to recognize the diagnosis of NASH or NAFLD. So in identifying that this is low, and it is, you know, it, there are studies out there that do show that uh, PCPs may under-recognize NASH. However, once it's recognized, by the hepatologist, then the PCPs would be the best to manage the comorbidities related to NASH, as the prompt su uh, suggests. So one may, again, the debate revolves around who is best suited to diagnose and manage NASH-related comorbidities, not the actual diagnosis of it. Um, and the role of the hepatologist was addressed as well. And this is essential to liver disease. The hepatologist should uh, diagnose, stage, and surveil liver disease as it naturally progresses. However, the comorbidities related to NASH, such as diabetes, such as cardiovascular disease, which is the leading cause of death among patients with NASH, should be managed by people who are, or excuse me, physicians who are capable and used to managing these types of diseases. Next, I would like to address the medications that are used uh, or addressed during the, um, the presentation. Medications such as puglitazone that was listed as a medication that could improve liver histology. However, it is a hypoglycemic or an anti-diabetic medication that can cause grave hypoglycemic events and has a black box warning 
for heart the uh, for heart failure. Vitamin E carries an increased incidence of prostate cancer. So unfortunately, a lot of these medications, although um, have been shown to be possibly helpful in NASH, these medications are not liver specific and should not be managed by um, the hepatologist. Uh, lastly, if the primary care physician misses the diagnosis of uh, NASH, the hepatologist can assist in identifying um, the diagnosis and then communicate with the primary care physician under a multidisciplinary team in order to help manage these patients. After all, is a hepatologist who's maybe prescribing metformin, are they going to remember, especially with the burden, the burden that is already on the hepatologist was the rising incidence of NASH, are they going to remember to do an annual foot exam? Are they going to remember to uh, have the patients go see an ophthalmologist annually to have their eyes checked? There isn't data that supports that the hepatologist is better than the primary care physician in carrying out these, um, this care for the patient. So overall, there was another uh, point that possibly primary care is overwhelmed. However, uh, and one can argue that hepatologists can be the quarterback as well. However, um, in a study that showed that uh, discussed hepatologists um, being the uh, lead on a multidisciplinary team to manage patients with NAFLD and type 2 diabetes, it can only show that a hepatology led team is feasible but not comparable or superior to a PCP led team. At the end of the day, the question is who is best equipped to treat metabolic comorbidities and prescribe the appropriate medications, the PCP. Who would be better to recognize the complications of metabolic comorbidities, the PCP? Would you prefer to be managed, to manage the conditions to help prevent cardiovascular disease? Or excuse me, who would you prefer to manage the conditions to prevent cardiovascular disease? Not your hepatologist. Thank you. At this point, we'd like to ask all the judges to um, show their faces, and we'd like the debate teams also to be on camera. Um, there are questions in the Q&A uh, box, and um, well, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to your three esteemed judges. Hi, I just, uh, I don't know if you, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I just want to say both teams, excellent job. Really, thank you so much. And I, uh, I've learned much from both of you. I have a, I'll, I'll start and I would like uh, maybe if Jackie can help bring the questions from our, our, our participants. But what I'd like to ask the Loyola team, don't you agree that the physicians that uh, are best able to handle the subset of, of patients that primarily primary presentation of metabolic syndrome is liver related. Don't you agree that those patients really should be primarily coordinated through the hepatologist with the assistance of PCP and cardiologists? But don't you agree that those patients that have that subset they sh the liver patients should be really monitored and, and, and taken care of by the hepatologist? Um, you know, as we suggested in our presentation, there are various classes of medications. We understand that weight loss is um, something that treats all of metabolic syndrome, but there are more nuances in patients, especially those that have insulin resistance, um, that need to be on anti-diabetic medications that are appropriate for their disease process. The other aspect of this that we mentioned um, is the increased incidence of cardiovascular events and death. And that is not something that I feel that hepatologists have the time to manage. We are all internal medicine trained. I do acknowledge that. But cardiovascular risk stratification um, it takes longer than just lab tests. You know, it takes stress tests. It takes possible angiograms, um, you know, echocardiograms, things like that, that 
Um, I do not believe that it is feasible for the hepatologist to manage um, when considering that the, the prevalence of NASH is increasing and we are more worried about um, staging the fibrosis than anything. And that's why you know, we should be part of a multidisciplinary team uh, where the, the PCP can manage um, some of those conditions that are not liver specific. Thank you. I'd like to follow up to Rocky's question. Excellent presentation, both of you. It's a hard topic, as we know. Um, for uh, Loyola, um, it is, uh, it's ideal if primary carrier could manage these things, but in reality, it's pretty difficult to do because most primary care providers work in silos. They don't have nurse practitioners um, and dietitians necessarily. So how do you think uh, we get past that? Because as transplant physicians, our job is beyond just staging the fibrosis. So what would you say is a good mechanism for communication or getting the primary care doctors to be more involved? And then for two-part question, so you, uh, for uh, Nebraska, um, it is a lot that we have on our plate as hepatologists. We manage a lot of things. So what do you think is the best way to, for us as hepatologists to um, get the resources that we need to manage someone with NASH and all its complications and how feasible do you think that is in most transplant centers? So I'll let Loyola go first. That's a great question. I mean, I think the hardest part is how do we get uh, primary care physicians to be involved again um, in patients where once we take ownership over their liver. Um, and I think that we definitely need to engage them in a way where it's part of a multidisciplinary team. Um, the biggest uh, part of having a PCP umbrella is that they can see the overall picture of the patient because they're most likely not just seeing a hepatologist only. They're also probably seeing an endocrinologist, probably also seeing a cardio a cardiologist. So primary care physicians are in a unique position to best address these multiple comorbidities as the umbrella and, and part of this multidisciplinary team, especially when we're thinking about these patients taking multiple drugs too. So polypharmacy is a big issue. Um, and uh, that's something that we could appeal to the PCP, especially when they are um, taking care of these patients. Um, they're best to understand which medications should be continued or discontinued when they're looking at the patient at an overall, uh, at a, a larger picture, as opposed to um, a hepatologist who tends to focus more on the liver. And so as the center of the patient's care, the PCP can facilitate communication um, with the various subspecialties to determine essential medications um, and care moving forward for the patient. Thank you. Yes, it is a lot to deal with when treating uh, someone with NAFLT, um, but that is our daily bread, and I think we're doing a good job at it. Once you get into a routine of what you're doing and have a checklist of things to go through, uh, we just do a better job in that regard. So we'd love to rely on PCPs to help us with all of that, but unfortunately, they're not getting the appropriate treatment that they need through their PCPs. We see a lot of NAFLD patients that have never had an A1C, they've never had a lipid panel, they've never had a stop bank on them. So it's... Um, they're not getting what they need from their PCPs and we have to um, provide better quality of care for our patients in that regard, so we just do it. Um, they don't have time. We do this um, for a living as well. Um, she mentioned the um, meds. We are comfortable uh, prescribing meds as well. We're trained in internal medicine. We know what we're doing. Once it's your routine, you just do it. Um, all meds have side effects. She mentions vitamin E and uh, pioglitazone. You just talk through your patient about um, side effects, risks, benefit, and you, you just do it. I think adding to that as well, I mean, it, we all train for at least you know three years, practice at least that long. You know, we did ophthalmology referrals and foot exams all day. So I think that's something we're all pretty uh, well versed in doing and we can incorporate it, that into our practice as well, uh, along with what Natalie mentioned with medications. Great answers. I have a quick question for both of you. You both make the case that a hepatologist should and needs to be involved in staging of NASH. So um, for the Loyola team, 
what is it about a hepatologist that needs to be involved in staging? Why could a primary physician not be involved in the staging and trained in the staging and then refer to hepatology for those who have fibrosis progression? And for the Nebraska team, the uh, Loyola team is making the case that, and you have as well, that the primary physicians are not doing a great job with diabetic management, with lipid management, with uh, screening for sleep apnea, what makes you think that a hepatologist would do a better job and what precautions or training should we be have to go through in order to potentially outperform the doctors who are, who are trained for this? Uh, you know, I think I'll start this by saying that, you know, when I was in residency, I don't think I knew what fibrosis meant and staging. And it may be something easy to teach. We have like, you know, protocols in place. We do fiber scan um, FIB4, uh, NFS, APRI, there's quite a few. Um, but the thing is the interpretation of all. So I'm sure you all have been in positions where you see the fiber scan results. It says F4, patient's platelets are normal. They don't really have any evidence of advanced fibrosis. You may not think that that F4 is real. You may treat them differently. Or you may have a patient, conversely, that's F1, F2. And I think these patients are more important, right? in saying that, you know, they may have thrombocytopenia. You see these referrals that PCPs place to hematologists for thrombocytopenia in the setting of, you know, possibly advanced chronic liver disease. Um, and in those patients, we may recognize that that F1, F2 may actually be F3, F4 and undergoing um, routine HCC surveillance is the best thing that you can do for that patient. Um, and so for that, you know, for that reason, I think that's why we do the additional three years, and some of us the additional then fourth year of training um, to really determine who are the patients that are at risk for advanced fibrosis and how to manage those patients differently. Okay, I think at this point we're going to be wrapping up the first debate. I want to give um, uh, Nebraska, just a minute to answer um, so that you have equal airtime. Um, but just know that that was the last question for this debate. Sure. Yeah. So th thank you for the question. I guess, you know, just to provide an answer to that, I think we're all used in, in hepatology clinics to searching for, you know, signs of decompensation in patients with liver disease, whether it be hepatic encephalopathy, ascites, uh, you know, performing EGDs for variceal surveillance. Um, as well as ultrasounds for HCC. So I think in the same light, you know, patients can be assessed with NASH uh, with a similar type of checklist, you know, being sure that they've had a stop bang score, do they need a sleep study, have they had a lipid profile in A1C, um, things like this. It can become very routine in our day-to-day -day practice, and I think this is very, uh, very practical. Thank you. So just know that there are some phenomenal questions in the Q&A box, and we'd like to invite the debaters to go ahead and answer them um, now that the pressure is off and you're done with your debate portion. Um, so please do answer them. You have a lot of wonderful questions. Thanks again to this first group. You've sort of raised the bar and set a very high standard for this evening. Uh, again, thank you to the fellows, their mentors, and the judges. I'm now gonna go ahead and introduce the second debate. And this second debate actually is um, in the area of organ allocation and patient advocacy. So in February 2020, a liver transplant allocation policy based on acuity circles was implemented. This included a conversion of each transplant hospital's median melt at transplant <clears throat> um, score to reflect transplants performed at hospitals within a radius of 250 nautical miles. Simulation modeling suggested that this policy would reduce pre-transplant deaths and reduce geographic variation in medical urgency scores at the time of transplant. Liver cancer is an indication for liver transplant with patients eligible for standardized MELD exception of median MELD at transplant minus three. Now, one year after policy implementation, evidence suggests so. Presenting the proposition is Rush University, and they are going to be arguing that this allocation system does allow for appropriate prioritization of liver transplant donor organs to patients with liver cancer. 
So you guys have a poll. Go ahead and fill out your poll before we begin. And do remember to keep donating to your favorite team, okay? Um, and I'm now going to go ahead and uh, introduce their mentor, Dr. Sujit Janardhan. And the fellows presenting Rush University are Dr. Jason Kramer and Dr. Sanmeet Singh. <clears throat> UI Health will present the con position that this allocation system puts patients with liver cancer at a disadvantage. Their mentor is Dr. Sean Koppe, and the fellows representing UI Health are Dr. Ili Goulam and Dr. Alexander Pan. Mm. So, debate team members, be prepared to unmute and turn your camera on when prompted. Once you're finished speaking, please mute and turn your camera off. And presenters, be sure to have your PowerPoint presentations open. I thought the first debate went very well. So, Dr. Jason Kramer from Rush University will be our first speaker. Timekeeper ready? Slides are up and you may begin. Good evening, colleagues, friends, judges. Thank you for joining us tonight as we explore important questions within our great field. My name is Jason Kramer and I am a second year GI fellow at Rush University Medical Center. The question for this debate is whether the new allocation system allows for appropriate prioritization of liver transplant donor organs to patients with liver cancer. My colleague, Sanmeet Singh and I are going to make it abundantly clear how the committee got it right. To start off, it is important to understand how we got here today. In the early 2000s, the mandate by the Department of Health and Human Services to allocate livers to the sickest patients prompted the implementation of MELD score. However, it was apparent early on that the MELD model did not incorporate the likelihood of HCC disease progression, threatening to cause a high waitlist dropout for these patients, moving them outside of transplant criteria. Interestingly, the initial decision to add exception points was not based on mortality or waitlist dropout data. It was actually based on modeling data, which estimated the risk of disease progression and can be seen in the figure on this slide. This figure shows the probability of progression-free survival based on tumor size over time, starting in the year 2002. In 2002, at 12 months, you can see the progression-free survival was less than 70% for a two centimeter tumor, less than 50% for a three centimeter tumor, and less than 20% for a four centimeter tumor. Given the high mortality in 2002, we agree that implementation of, of HCC exception points was warranted. While the addition of exception points had good intentions, it gave HCC patients an unnecessary and unfair advantage. With these changes, liver transplantation for HCC skyrocketed from 5% in 2001 to 30% in 2017. The pendulum had swung too far the opposite direction, and we have been trying to balance it for the last 20 years. From 2002 to 2005, the exception points for T2 lesions went from 29 to 22, and T1 lesions were no longer granted exception points. In 2015, there was a mandatory six-month delay prior to MELD exception points being granted. Despite all of these changes that were made to make allocation more equitable, still more than 30% of liver transplants were for HCC. It is encouraging to see that the massive disparity in transplant rates for HCC versus those without HCC has been improving over the years as demonstrated by the graph on the top left of this slide. However, a disparity still exists and has been relatively stagnant since 2016. If you look closely, the transplant rate for patients with HCC exceptions is roughly double that of patients without MELD exception. Despite the reduction in transplant rates for patients with HCC, the mortality for HCC patients on the wait list has actually fallen in the last 10 years. We think the main reason is the advancement of treatment options. The treatment landscape that existed in 2001 for HCC was drastically different than the treatment landscape in 2021. Local regional therapy is readily used and has been proven to be not only effective as bridging therapy to transplant, but also, in some cases, curative. As you can see, for a solitary lesion less than five centimeters, the one-year survival ranges from 96 to 100%, which is better than liver transplant. 
Furthermore, the three-year and five-year survival for lesions under three centimeters is comparable to transplant. This data shows that granting HCC patients artificial exception points is simply not necessary. In fact, the group of patients with tumors less than three centimeters, according to Dr. Mehta and his colleagues, has shown a waitlist dropout rate of less than 2% over a two-year period. These patients with small tumors clearly have excellent survival in response to local regional therapy. I can't believe that we would fathom prioritizing these patients over someone with a natural melt of 31 and greater than 50% 90-day mortality. Now, with this data in mind, we are not saying patients with HCC should not be transplanted, but we do not think that all HCC patients should be given unneeded exception points. What bothers me the most is that these points are unfair to non-HCC patients. To give you guys an example of what we are talking about here, let's compare two patients. Patient A on the left has HCC with a lesion less than three centimeters in a natural meld of 18. He was listed for transplant over one year ago. Based on the old system, this patient will accumulate a meld score of 34 after one year, yet his three-month mortality is less than 20%. And if you recall the data we just presented earlier, his five-year mortality after local regional therapy is less than 25%. On the other hand, on the right, you have patient B who has decompensated cirrhosis with a MELD score of 34 and a three-month mortality of greater than 50%. So which patient do you think should receive the liver? Should it go to the patient with a, a three-month mortality of less than 20% or should it go to the patient with a three-month mortality of greater than 50%? I don't know about you guys, but I'm feeling the desire to swipe right. This graph by Dr. Mehta and colleagues again reiterates our points that patients without HCC across the United States are dropping off the waitlist at a higher percentage than patients with HCC. This is why we feel patients with HCC were getting an unfair advantage with MELD exception points and the MELD escalator system. The most recent change in MELD exception rules does not just involve the MELD score. It also has to do with an unfair advantage of the prior region's system. Previously, there was a major variance of median meld at transplant between the regions. For example, region 10 had a median meld at transplant of 25, while region 9 had a median meld of transplant of 33. By giving everyone, regardless of the region, the same exact meld exception score after six months, we created equality, but not equity. Given this geographic inequity, acuity circles were implemented in February of 2020. Based on the OPTN reports released this week, the median meld allocation at time of transplant was cut in half. In conclusion, we feel the pendulum had swung too far the opposite direction and we've been trying to balance it for the last 20 years. Patients with HCC were previously over-prioritized and given unnecessary and more importantly, unfair exception points. The prior systems disadvantaged non-HCC patients as they have far higher waitlist dropout rates when compared to HCC patients. Local regional therapy can provide excellent and sometimes curative outcomes in select patients. These patients simply do not need aggressive meld exception points. Implementation of acuity circles decreased the variance in median meld scores at transplant, significantly reducing regional disparities. We believe we made it abundantly clear why this allocation system absolutely does allow for appropriate prioritization of liver transplant donor organs to patients with liver cancer. Thank you. Thank you. And now presenting the con position is Dr. Ely Gulam of UI Health. Timekeeper ready? You may begin. All right. Thanks, Rush, for that pleasant presentation. Thank you to the ALF for organizing this event, and it's a pleasure being here today. Okay. So on February 4, 2020, UNOS implemented a new liver and intestinal organ distribution system called the Acuity Circles or AC model. The data cited by the OPT and board of directors to support this model was based on SRTR registry of transplant recipients 2018 analysis. 
So prior to this policy, donation-specific areas were used as units of allocation, but now acuity circles are used where the median melt at transplant is calculated for transplant centers within a 250 nautical mile radius around donor hospitals. The intentions were good for this policy change, but we are not here to debate the merits of the new policy in general, but rather how it has affected patients with liver cancer. So today we're arguing that this allocation system puts patients with liver cancer at a disadvantage. The data we present to you will wholeheartedly demonstrate that. So HTC is a growing problem. As you can see, the incidence in the US for HTC compared to worldwide is elevated, as is the mortality. In the US, the rate of death from liver cancer increased by 43% between 2000 and 2016. With a five-year survival of 18%, liver cancer is the second most lethal tumor after pancreatic cancer. Thankfully, liver transplantation is a remarkable therapeutic option for patients with liver cancer at the early stage. In addition to removing the tumor, liver transplant has the advantage of curing the underlying liver disease. As demonstrated by the figure on the right, patients with tumors with melanoma criteria have a real chance at five-year survival with transplant. However, with more aggressive disease, treatment options are much more limited and survival time drastically decreases. So there have been multiple policy changes with different allocation systems over the years in an effort to benefit HCC patients and exception point patients. And the most recent iteration is the acuity circles. But we are now 14 months post policy implementation and the data suggests that this allocation system puts patients with liver cancer at a disadvantage for two reasons. There's an increase in number of liver cancer patients removed from the list due to death or too sick. And HCC exception liver cancer patients are getting transmitted less Post policy. So I will first discuss how there is an increase in number of liver cancer patients falling off the list. So the OPTN released a nine-month report post-security circle implementation. So this is the real, real data after February 2020. As we can see here, this table demonstrates the percentage of patients being removed from transplant list due to being too sick or to death. Two, so pre-policy, 2.5% of patients uh, fit criteria for HC exception. Post-policy, this increased to 3.1%. So, based, and with the percentage of pre-policy and post-policy for non-exception, uh, percentages not, did not change for re removal due to death or to say. The writers of this report say there are slightly more exceptions, HCC exception patients falling off the list due to being too sick. But more is more. To us, post-policy, there's more people falling off the list. Next, we will show that HCC exception and liver cancer patients are getting transplanted less post policy. So, this figure demonstrates that overall, across all MELD scores, pre policy compared to post policy, there's a decrease in transplant rates. So, pre policy is the policy before the acuity circles, so NLRB, which is the National Liver Review Board. Transplants per 100 active years decrease from 79 to 57.25, and the confidence intervals do not overlap. Now let us focus on a certain group of patients, which is the MELD of 15 to 28. Why is this important to us? Because based on the OPTN reports, more than 95% of transplant centers in the US have a median MELD of transplant of 31, which means with the exception points, they would meet the criteria. So MMA T minus three of 15 to 28. So most of our liver cancer patients fall within a range of MELD of 15 to 28. And as we can still see here, Transplants per 100 active patient years decreased from 197 to 126. And again, the confidence intervals aren't even close. So our point is further solidified with the recent release of the 12 month report, which was released just one week ago. OPTN compared percent of transplants by HCC exception, pre policy to post policy in every region. And we clearly see decreased number of transplants per HCC patients. As you can see, region one, HC exception, pre-policy and post-policy, there's a decrease from 19.5% to 17.9%. Same can be seen with region two, less. Region three, less. Region four, less. Region six, less transplants. Only in region five and nine, so two out of the 11 regions, did the HCC patients benefit from this new allocation system. So in nine out of 11 regions, HCC patients were transplanted less as we can see here. So here we have region seven, which is our home region. We are yet again seeing less transplants for HCC exception patients. As you can see here, pre-policy 18.2%, post-policy 16.5. So this is the SRTR analysis report or the simulation model that was used to test the acuity circle. 
the model predicted more transplants, so over here, current versus acuity, predicted more transplants for ACC exception patients. But this is exactly the opposite of what we're seeing. The model is well thought out, but imperfect. As St. Fauci once said, models are only as good as the assumptions you put into them. This table, also from the 12 month report, shows that the percent of transplanted patients with HCC exceptions decreased from pre policy to post policy nationally. While a decrease from 16% to 14.1% may not seem like much, there were 123 fewer HCC patients receiving transplants. This amounts to a 12% reduction in transplanted HCC patients. Less is more false, less is less. So 14 months post acuity circle policy, this allocation system puts patients with liver cancer at a disadvantage. One, because there's an increase in number of liver cancer patients removed from this due to death or too sick. And two, ACC exception liver cancer patients are getting transplanted less post policy. Do not be led astray by our opponent's distractions. The evidence clearly shows that those with liver cancer are being removed from the list for being too sick or dying and are being transplanted less post acuity circle policy. We're not here to debate the merits of the acuity circle policy as a whole, but rather how it affects our patients with liver cancer. So this allocation system puts patients with liver cancer at a disadvantage. Thank you. Okay, okay. well, we have quite a lot of work laid for uh, the um, rebuttal piece. So at this point, providing the rebuttal of the pro position is Dr. Alex Pan from UI Health. Alex? Thank you, Dr. Taddy, and thank you, Rush, for your uh, interesting arguments. So regarding your first argument that HCC patients are already over-prioritized and advantaged in the transplant system, I'd like to point out and remind everyone that the original purpose of implementing acuity circles in the first place was not to address any perceived benefits that liver cancer patients have in the transplant process. It was actually in regards to a concern that the HRSA had that the DSA specific re, uh, region aerial system um, had led to geographic inequities and thus a problem with the OPTN final rule, particularly the section that states that the allocation policy should not be due to patients place of listing or place of residence. And, you know, it's, it is true that historically HCC patients have had a benefit in the transplant process, but as you mentioned in your own argument, there have been a number of policies up until now to try and address this. Most notably in 2015, there was a cap and delay policy change that capped patients HCC exception points at 34 and delayed them six months before they could receive any exception points in the first place. That cap of 34 ensured that the sickest liver patients, those with a melt of 35 or above, would receive transplants and that those organs would not go to patients with liver cancer. Ishak et al. in 2018 published an analysis um, examining the effects of that policy change. And in that policy, they found that with the cap and delay, there was a comparable rate of more weightless mortality and weightless dropout with the cap and delay policy. Regarding weightless dropout on its own, HCC patients actually had a higher rate of weightless dropout from 5.8% compared to non-HCC patients of 3%, so an almost twofold higher rate of weightless dropout. Now you state that HCC patients have lower rates of weightless mortality, or Gorgren et al. in their article stated that weightless dropout is essentially a death sentence for these patients with HCC, as their prognosis after dropping up the weightless is only three months. So while the statistics seem like weightless mortality is going down, with the increased weightless dropout, that's essentially condemning our HCC patients to death. Now, uh, Dr. Heimbach herself, who was the chair of the Liver and Intestinal Organ Transplantation Committee, who oversaw the implementation of our acuity circle policy and is evaluating it afterwards, stated in her board meeting proposing the policy that the cabin delay policy had brought an equal rate of transplant for HCC and non-HCC patients and had addressed any disparities that they had before. Now, I'm glad that you guys brought up local regional therapies. Um, the current ASLD guidelines for the management of HCC state that there is a role for local regional therapy, but as a bridge to transplant, not as a curative um, uh, modality on its own. 
Um, certain modalities such as tear, taste, Y90 are all potential ways to help halt any disease progression that may occur while patients are on the waiting list, but they are not the actual treatment for the cancer or the underlying liver disease itself. And any sort of studies that suggested that they helped were all single, single center studies. Agopian et al. in 2017 conducted a study analyzing over 3,600 patients from a multi-center consortium to see what the role of local regional therapy is for these patients with HCC. And what he found corroborated was seen in these single center studies that local regional therapy did not decrease the rate of HCC recurrence post-transplant and also did not improve outcomes. In fact, he showed that with increasing amount of treatments, patients actually had higher rates of recurrence and had worse uh, five-year survival afterwards. The patients that did respond were those who only had complete pathologic response, but those who had only a partial necrosis actually did worse afterwards. And in the ASLD guidelines, they also state that the risk of hepatic decompensation with local regional therapy should also be considered. So it does not apply to everybody. And finally, you argue that the geographic variance goes down in terms of patients after the acuity policy change. That may be true, but it does not apply to one patient population in particular, our HCC exception patients. Dr. Heimbach published a paper in November 2020 analyzing particularly the question of how is the allocation policy affecting HCC patients and found that um, the geographic inequity only affects them. If you can imagine, we have paid two patients in different parts of the country with the same disease, the same mortality risk, but at different transplant uh, exception points, one is going to get transplanted before the other. So in summary, we would like to argue, and the data that has come now clearly shows that patients with liver cancer are being disadvantaged with the new system because of higher rates of waitlist dropout and because of lower rates of life-saving transplant. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pan. All right, let's see what your opponent has to say in response. So now presenting the next rebuttal is Dr. Sanmeet Singh. Dr. Singh? All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sanmeet, and I'm also a second-year gastroenterology and hepatology fellow at Rush. I believe what we have presented tonight is a convincing argument that before the recent allocation changes made in February 2020, we're providing a disadvantage to non-HCC patients. The goal of liver transplantation is to save as many lives as possible by reducing the inequity in liver transplant access. This new allocation system does just that. My colleagues in UIC have brought up a few points that I would like to address. My opponents mentioned that there is a subset of patients with advanced cancers that have a higher risk of disease progression that may risk their transplant eligibility. They also mentioned that the variance does not affect these patients. However, it's important to note that HCC patients only account for 10% of patients on the transplant wait list. My colleagues would like to prioritize a subsegment of these patients while disadvantaging the other 10,000 patients on the wait list. It's also important to note that mortality of HCC patients on the transplant waitlist has actually de declined over the past decade. In fact, there is a subset of HCC patients with a waitlist dropout of less than 2% over two years. I also don't want you to forget that HCC treatment in 2021 is very different than it was 20 years ago. The Lewandowski paper from Northwestern clearly shows that survival with patients with radiation segmentectomy can be comparable to transplant. It's not only used for bridging, like Dr. Pan mentioned, it's actually curative as well. The population of patients, this population of patients should not be unfairly prioritized. We also agree with our UIC friends that all patients with HCC are not the same. The tumor volume doubling time for HCC is quite heterogeneous and some tumors are rapidly growing, while others are indolent. This is why the new system continues to provide maladaptive exception points to these patients at just three minus their hospital's median maladaptive transplant. In fact, the most recent data released by OPTN this week, which was actually showed by our opponent, 
shows that the number of patients being transplanted with HCC exception points is similar post policy. There's always going to be a little bit of variation because of the small sample size. And also, the only difference is that these patients are actually being transplanted at lower MEL scores. I applaud the fact that UIC wants to build a better MELD allocation system for HCC patients. But I ask them, what factors should we use in our new system? Should we look at tumor markers or gene mutations? There's D34, there's CK7, there's HSP70, or should we look at the TER gene mutation? We also know that certain ethnicities and patient characteristics have worse prognosis when it comes to HCC. Should we start giving them exception points as well? Based on the data we have so far, this is the best allocation policy. At the end of the day, what we care about is that the new system works and has its intended effect. With data released this week, we see that the variance in MELT score at time of transplant has been cut in half. This data also shows that we are actually prioritizing our sickest patients. If you actually look at actual data from the study that was cited earlier by our opponent, the transplant rate for these patients have increased two to three fold. You actually have to look at the table, but the actual transplant rates for these patients have increased two to three fold. There was also a mention of LRT therapies and hepatic decompensation. Multiple studies, including Dr. Salem in 2018 and Dr. Riaz in 2011, have suggested that local regional therapy is generally safe and has a very low risk of radiation-induced liver disease. However, if these patients who are sick have multifocal HCC and were to decompensate after local regional therapy, this will actually increase their MELT score naturally and make them eligible for liver transplant. Today, we have made it abundantly clear that this new allocation system allows for appropriate distribution of donor livers to patients with liver cancer. The previous system provided an unfair advantage to patients with HCC as evidenced by their improving survival over the last decade while it double the transplant rate. A big reason for this improved survival is the advances in local regional therapy that have allowed these patients on the wait list to have excellent outcomes without, without undue risk of disease progression. We have clearly shown you that in a subset of patients with HCC, local regional therapy can provide outcomes comparable to liver transplant. We have clearly shown you that the implementation of acuity circles reduces regional disparities Okay, rebuttals with a passion tonight. Um, so I would like to now invite the judges to go on camera. And uh, so Drs. Fimmel, Kim, and Singh, please put your cameras on and unmute when you're asking questions. The teams also should be on camera and I'll leave it to the judges. So, uh, first of all, I think both of you did a wonderful job presenting the data. Uh, and this is a complicated area, which uh, mathematically can be challenging and statistically, I think, is very complex as well. For the, U for the UIC uh, uh, discussions, I wanted to ask you, you showed a lot of data that are hot off the press. And you showed us a lot of data in a short time, which was almost difficult to follow. What I didn't see was uh, a peer-reviewed publication. These are all raw data coming out of the, the transplant statistics. And you showed numerical differences in small trends, but do you think, this, is it premature to make a conclusion from these data? Would you not rather wait uh, until there is a published paper in a peer-reviewed journal? before you try to, uh, again, change the allocation rules. So the question is, what is the timing? Uh, when, when do you think it's appropriate? What data should persuade us to change the allocation policy again? And when do you think those data would be available? Because it seems to me that it's a little early. Well, I completely agree with you. And I think that's an excellent point that you make. Um, I, I do think it is a little too early to be asking this question. Um, you know, a lot of times when we look at survival outcomes after liver transplant, we're looking at 
one year, three year, and five years. And here we are only 14 months after the policy implementation debating its merits. Um, but oftentimes as providers, we have the unenviable task to assess and reassess any rules that we may implement to try and benefit our patients. Um, and we have been tasked tonight to debate a policy that again was implemented only 14 months ago. So in an ideal world, should we maybe wait three years, five years before we re-examine the question? And yes, that, that is possible. But again, as providers trying to take care of our patients who are in dire need of uh, livers, um, oftentimes we don't have the luxury of time and we need to get that answer now. But that's why the OPTN has frequent board discussions and review the policy. And it's, it's a moving target. You know, allocation policy is, is a difficult thing to debate and it's a moving target. And we just try to do our best with the data that we have to try to make the conclusions that we can. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, can I, can I uh, get an opportunity to respond to that? Yeah, so um, basically, you know, Dr. Pan is absolutely right that um, this, it's only been 14 months since the implementation of this data in the middle of a pandemic uh, when a lot of our patients were told not to come to the hospital. So I think it's a little bit too early to make any changes based on the newest data. Um, the other thing is if you actually look at th that data that um, was, was mentioned, um, it's actually statistically flawed because the amount of patients after the policy are very small. The end is very small and there's a lot of variability. So the percent dropout uh, for HCC patients is actually um, higher than what was actually cited. Um, but that's, you know, these are the small debates that we can have later about the actual data. And that's why I think it's important by, uh, that we need a publication. Um, to actually before we can present raw data. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, it's, I think it's too early to put your hands up and say that, no, uh, we, need, we, need, we need to change now. I think uh, we need to give it some more time um, and, 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 let, and let this implementation keep going on before we can say yes or no. Thank you. Um, I think you both sides did an amazing job um, uh, and presented some uh, fantastic data. This is a very difficult uh, topic, I think, to debate. Um, for the RUSH team, you know, you talked about that there were some patients where uh, HCC patients that should be given extra points. Uh, could you maybe uh, shed some light on which patients uh, those would be, um, who would get some points, who wouldn't. Again, you're starting to fall into some bias again. So is there um, any studies that shows a, a little bit more definitively in the current model, who might get those exception points? Um, so there's definitely a subset of patients, uh, as we know, that are outside the Milan criteria that get local regional therapy. Uh, they get bridged and finally get a transplant. And these patients have, you know, tend to have, you know, aggressive tumors. Um, I think uh, it's an excellent question because we aren't there yet. I think it's tough to say who should get exception points um, because, you know, HCC is so heterogeneous. Um, there's certain, you know, as, as we know, previously we've been said, uh, you know, hepatitis B, HCC is because of hepatitis B have been really aggressive. And we have seen hepatitis B data incidence has been going down because of the new therapies. And we have NAFLD going up, alcoholic liver disease going up. And you know, there's some data that shows maybe those tumors are more indolent. So I think we need more tumor markers, more gene mutations, uh, more data on how we can actually uh, stratify those patients um, when it comes to how aggressive these tumors are before, um, start, before we start uh, giving them ex uh, exception points. Um, or actually, let me, let me correct that before we start giving them uh, high enough exception points, uh, you know, compared to a patient who are, have decompensated through a set of ML 34. I think also to piggyback on that, uh, Dr. Lewandowski and the group at Northwestern did an excellent job of showing us patients that have HCC that respond very, very well to radiation segmentectomy and have, you know, really reduced mortality over, you know, one, three, and five years. So we think, as Dr. Samit Singh just mentioned, we think there's a lot more research that needs to be done, but I think we're starting to identify a certain subset of patients with HCC that have a lot of favorable outcomes to therapies available that are not transplant. But we obviously think patients with HCC should be transplanted, but more needs to be researched as to which subsegment of those patients. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, thank you to both teams. You both uh, did a fantastic job um, presenting information. Uh, I have a question for the U of I team. Um, Alex, I think you uh, 
did address this uh, very well, but just to kind of uh, maybe flesh it out a little bit further, um, the, uh, the, that initial study that was presented by the Rush team um, by Cheng in 2002, that was actually my friend and co-fellow who wrote that paper, um, a lot has changed since then. And certainly a lot has changed in the field of managing HCC since that paper came out. And I suspect that that's probably a, a large factor when it comes to determining the prior, prioritization of uh, HCC patients. Can you uh, kind of uh, maybe answer that again or address that particular issue? I apologize, Dr. Kim. Do you mind just clarifying the question a little bit more? Sure, sure. Just my question is, um, since O2, uh, a lot has changed in regard to the treatment of HCC uh, that has, I guess, leveled the playing field uh, for patients with HCC that perhaps they don't need to be rushed to the top of the transplant list quite so quickly. Um, how would you address that, that question? I see. Yeah, I think that's a very pertinent question because one might suspect that HCC patients have a supposed luxury that they have local regional therapies available to use as a bridge to halt disease progression while awaiting a transplant, whereas those who are in the ICU due to decompensated cirrhosis don't have you know, comparable bridging therapies. But right now, with the information that we have, the guidelines do not support using them with, for patients with Milan criteria as a treatment in and of themselves. I wasn't trying to say that there's no role for local regional therapy in the management of cancer patients by any means, but I think I, I shudder at the prospect of making our cancer patients wait any longer, potentially allowing their disease to progress while waiting for a transplant, which we know is a curative and therapeutic option for these cancer patients. Thank you. Okay. So I have been told that we should wrap this debate up. Um, you will have a poll that you'll see in front of you. Please answer that poll. We're going to give the judges time to deliberate and thank our teams for a fantastic debate and for their preparation and to thank their mentors as well for helping them prepare and our fantastic judges. Um, at this point, I just want to remind you that this is the last opportunity you have to donate to your favorite team. Um, so you can see here the standings. Um, so we have uh, <clears throat> UI Health in the lead uh, with Rush University coming in very close behind. Uh, please be generous. Donate to your favorite team. Donate to a phenomenal cause. Um, and uh, just, uh, you know, remember that uh, the ALF um, really carries its mission very seriously. And for that, we need funds. Okay, so we are now ready to begin our third debate. This debate is on the topic of cost effectiveness in general hepatology. So, terlipressin, an analog of vasopressin used as a vasoactive drug, is approved for the treatment of hepatorenal syndrome and variceal bleeding outside the United States. These two teams are going to be debating whether there is sufficient evidence to support FDA approval in the United States. So, first up is Northwestern Medicine arguing that evidence supports FDA approval in the United States. Their mentor is Dr. Dan Ganger, and the fellows representing Northwestern Medicine are Dr. Hirsch Schroff and Dr. Avish Tulabath. So next, Advocate Lutheran General Fellows will argue that there is not enough evidence to support FDA approval in the United States. Their mentor is Dr. Ken Arvorden, and the fellows representing Advocate Lutheran General are Dr. Ryan Hoff and Dr. Natasha Shah. Debate team members, please be prepared to unmute and turn on your camera when prompted. Once you're finished speaking, please mute and turn your camera off. And for presenters, be sure to have your PowerPoint presentations open. We've had a pretty uneventful night in terms of technological glitches, which has made me extremely happy. So <clears throat> arguing that the evidence supports FDA approval in the U.S. is Dr. Avesh Tulavath of the Northwestern University. 
Avesh, why don't we get your slides up? Great, timekeeper ready. You may begin. Good evening. Today's debate centers on terlopressin, a vasoactive drug which is approved for the treatment of hepatorenal syndrome and variceal bleeding outside of the United States. As you all know, the progression from compensated liver disease to decompensated cirrhosis takes place over years to decades. Unfortunately, once our patients decompensate, they experience a variety of life-threatening complications, including hepatorenal syndrome. While we have treatment options for other complications of decompensated liver disease, here in the US, we do not have any suitable treatments for HRS. Off-label use of midodrine, octreotide, and norepinephrine have largely proven to be ineffective. Renal replacement therapy is a temporary option as a bridge to transplant, but conveys significant morbidity and mortality. Liver transplantation is the only life-saving intervention, but most patients with HRS are either not transplanted candidates or die prior to liver transplantation. Sorry, I got the correct one. Thus, there is significant unmet medical need associated with HRS in the US. Over the next few minutes, I will demonstrate that evidence clearly supports FDA approval of trilopressin in the US. I will do this by highlighting three main points. One, the confirmed trial met the pre-specified primary efficacy endpoint set by the FDA itself for approval. Two, the reported adverse events in the confirmed trial have not been reproduced in the general literature and can be mitigated with evidence-based selection of patients who receive the drug. Three, terlopressin is more effective at reversing HRS than other off-label HRS treatments currently available in the United States. The confirmed study, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in March of this year, is the third clinical trial conducted to achieve FDA approval of trilopressin within the US. The confirmed study was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial in which 300 patients with HRS were randomized into two groups, trilopressin plus albumin versus placebo plus albumin. It is critical to note that the study protocol was designed with FDA oversight. Specifically, the primary and secondary efficacy endpoints, which I will discuss shortly, were pre-specified and approved by the FDA itself to achieve FDA approval. The primary efficacy endpoint set by the FDA was verified HRS reversal, defined by serum creatinine of less than or equal to 1.5 on two consecutive values, at least two hours apart, with the patient remaining alive and not on renal replacement therapy for greater than or equal to 10 days. In this study, 29.1% of patients with terlopressin achieved the primary endpoint of verified HRS reversal, as opposed to only 15.8% in the placebo group, demonstrating a significant improvement in the terlopressin group. The secondary efficacy endpoints in the study were HRS reversal, durability of HRS reversal, HRS reversal in the SIRS subgroup, and verified HRS reversal with no recurrence of HRS by day 30. As you can see here, terlopressin achieved all but one of the secondary efficacy endpoints, demonstrating significant benefits of terlopressin over placebo. Once again, it is crucial to note how and why these primary and secondary endpoints were selected under the guidance of the FDA. 30-day and 90-day mortality were not primary or secondary endpoints, and for good reason. Patients with HRS are extremely sick with decompensated cirrhosis and have an exceedingly high mortality rate. As we all know, the only curative treatment for HRS is liver transplantation. Thus, it is unreasonable to expect any medication, whether it's terlopressin or any other drug, to significantly decrease overall mortality. The goal of terlopressin is to reverse HRS in order to stabilize patients decrease ICU admissions, decrease the need for renal replacement therapy, and potentially maintain liver transplant candidacy for a few select patients. When put in the correct context, terlopressin performed remarkably well. Here we look at the pool data of three clinical trials that we had talked about earlier. Among the patients alive through 90 days, the terlopressin group showed, was significantly less likely to require renal replacement therapy. After transplantation, the terlopressin group was also less likely to require renal replacement therapy. Finally, among patients who received the transplant, the terlopressin group demonstrated significant improved survival at 90 days, 
compared to the placebo group. Despite achieving the primary efficacy endpoint set forth by the FDA itself, however, the FDA raised concerns over potential adverse events in the terlopressin group. Our colleagues from Advocate will likely point out that terlopressin group had a higher rate of respiratory failure and sepsis, with the FDA calling to question the safety profile of this drug. However, it is vital that these findings be evaluated in the larger context of available literature. Here, I highlight two meta-analyses published within the last five years, one comparing terlopressin to other vasoactive drugs, and the other comparing it to the placebo or no intervention. Both meta-analyses found that there is no significant increase in the overall risk of serious adverse events with terlopressin. The key to avoiding significant respiratory events is to identify high-risk groups and adjust clinical practice accordingly, much like what has been done in Europe for years. In assessing the pool data, uh, the authors of the confirmed study found multiple risk factors for developing respiratory failure with terlopressin and conducted the following mitigation plan. Terlopressin should be avoided in patients with a serum cranium greater than five. Patients with new onset respiratory symptoms should be stabilized prior to receiving terlopressin. Terlopressin dosing should be interrupted if pulmonary edema or pneumonia develops. Hepatic encephalopathy should be treated and airway protected prior to initiating terlopressin. And albumin or other fluids should be used judiciously along with diuretics as indicated. Applying this mitigation plan to the confirmed data, retrospectively, the terlopressin group was found to have fewer serious adverse events in the placebo group. Moreover, the terlopressin group was also found to have a lower 90-day mortality than the placebo group. This demonstrates that the adverse events and subsequent higher mortality can be avoided with appropriate patient selection. Not only did terlopressin meet FDA requirements for approval, it is more effective than alternate HRS treatment options available. This has been demonstrated in multiple studies. Kavlin et al. compared terlopressin to midodrine and octreotide, and showed that terlopressin significantly improved HRS reversal. And Aurora et al. also compared terlopressin to norepinephrine and showed the same thing. It's also important to note that terlopressin does not require ICU admission. To conclude, we have just highlighted an abundance of evidence clearly supporting FDA approval of terlopressin. Not only did the confirmed study show that terlopressin met FDA endpoints, but we've also shown that potential adverse events can be mitigated and that terlopressin can improve clinical outcomes. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Tulavath. All right. So presenting the opposing argument now is Dr. Natasha Shaw of Advocate Lutheran General. Dr. Shaw? Timekeeper ready? You may begin. Good evening. And thank you to the American Liver Foundation for the opportunity to participate in today's event. We will be presenting the argument that the use of terlopressin should not be approved by the FDA for the treatment of hepatorenal syndrome and variceal bleeding in the US. We understand and acknowledge that HRS and variceal bleeding are life-threatening complications, but we agree with the FDA's most recent decision that terlopressin should not be approved. It does not have a favorable overall risk benefit profile and raises serious concerns. Long-term benefits of terlopressin regarding survival and mortality have not been seen, and it does not provide superior treatment in comparison to the agents available in the U.S. Terlopressin, a vasopressin receptor agonist, is able to reverse the hemodynamic abnormalities of HRS. By binding to V1 and V2 receptors, it can lead to smooth muscle constriction and fluid retention, ultimately resulting in a rise of mean arterial pressure and elevated circulating volume. However, its underlying pharmacodynamic activity can result in cardiovascular and pulmonary side effects. This is concerning when the target audience for this drug are patients with chronic liver disease who already have underlying cardiopulmonary complications. 
The next several slides will be in reference to the, as mentioned, three randomized double-blinded placebo controlled trials, which compared terlipressin plus albumin versus albumin alone in cirrhosis patients with hepatorenal syndrome. The confirmed study, though a recent and highly anticipated study, may provide data that shows that it's effective in HRS reversal. It also brings attention to the fact that terlipressin can cause serious adverse events, which is why the FDA has decided not to approve terlipressin after its third study. Results of the confirmed study alone and the pooled analysis of three studies reveal that the incidence of respiratory failure, GI disorders, bradycardia, fluid overload, and infection were all higher in the terlipressin arm versus placebo. Though reported to be mild to moderate adverse events, this proves that the administration of terlipressin requires close monitoring, otherwise it can result in significant harm. A higher percentage of subjects in the terlipressin arm had adverse events that led to early drug discontinuation. Of more concern, the incidence of serious adverse events resulting in prolonged hospitalization or death was markedly higher in the terlipressin arm as compared to placebo. There was a higher incidence of respiratory failure characterized by positive airway pressure need or intubation, serious infections such as septic shock, GI bleeding, and abdominal pain. It was also seen that patients with severe liver dysfunction and kidney disease, the patients who are in dire need of effective medical therapy, were most vulnerable to having these severe adverse events. Here on the slide, we see that all-cause mortality up to 90 days was higher in the terlipressin arm as compared to the placebo arm. The incidence of death rises after day 40 in the terlipressin arm, which again is concerning. Adverse events leading to death are shown on this slide. 18 out of the 28 or 65% of those who had developed respiratory failure resulted in death, and the majority of these patients died within 10 days of receiving medical therapy. Sepsis was another leading cause of mortality, which again happened later in their clinical course. This data shows an association between terlipressin and developing sepsis, which requires further investigation. Terlipressin was not effective in HRS reversal for those with the serum creatinine above five, and overall survival was shown to be lower in comparison to placebo. It may have been effective in decreasing serum creatinine in those with a creatinine less than five, but it does not show any benefit in overall survival. Patients with HRS are in need of a liver transplant, and in the confirmed study, we see that the patients in the trilopressin arm were less likely to undergo liver transplant within 90 days in comparison to the placebo arm. This may have been due to the fact that respiratory and sepsis complications preve prevented these patients from receiving a much needed transplant. Terlipressin is also known to have ischemic complications, though infrequent, there was a seven times higher risk of intestinal ischemia, cardiac ischemia, and peripheral ischemia, which could possibly lead to gangrene. These complications can be catastrophic and are often irreversible and need to be kept in mind. We believe the confirmed study results are disappointing, but in the U.S., we do have other agents such as norepinephrine, a alpha and beta agonist that allows vasoconstriction, which can result in increased mean arterial pressure and increased cardiac output. Since 2002, there has been some clinical evidence that in the ICU setting, norepinephrine can be used effectively to reverse HRS. A meta-analysis consisting of eight randomized control trials compared terlipressin and norepinephrine and reported equivalent efficacy in HRS reversal. We believe norepinephrine being less costly and associated with less adverse effects would be a better choice. Octreotide and minadrin are also agents that can be used in the non-ICU setting. The combination therapy has been shown to be effective in increasing mean arterial pressure, increasing renal plasma flow, GFR, and urine volume. In 2007, a study consisting of 60 patients with HRS were treated with this combination therapy and were shown to have an improvement in 30-day mortality. Octreotide is the recommended drug for variceal bleeding, and when we compare terlipressin and octreotide as adjuncts to endoscopic therapy, the results of this match would show that there is no clear winner between the two drugs. In 2014, a prospective multi-center randomized non-inferiority trial characterized the effects of terlipressin, somatostatin, and octreotide when these were initiated before endoscopic treatment in patients with acute variceal bleeding. The study concluded that the control of bleeding and mortality rates did not significantly differ between the three agents. 
However, the study did find that patients treated with trilopressin were more likely to develop hyponatremia. This highlights another adverse event associated with trilopressin that we did not discuss, but also proves that it requires further monitoring when administered. In 2012, a meta-analysis of randomized control trials compared vasoactive agents and their efficacy in variceal bleeding, and results again showed no difference between octreotide and terlipressin in regards to hemostasis and mortality. The FDA's role is to allow advancement of new medications that are proved to be efficacious but also safe. Terlipressin is associated with high risks for adverse events, which can be fatal, and there's no clear benefit in mortality or prolonged survival. The data shows it to be ineffective in patients with severe kidney disease, severe liver dysfunction, and it's recommended that it be avoided in patients with cardiopulmonary disease, which really limits the population who may benefit from such drug. Now, one can propose mitigation strategies, but we believe this will not be able to avoid patient harm. There are alternative drugs in the U.S. of equivalent efficacy with good safety profiles for HRS and variceal bleeding, so there's no need to approve such a harmful drug. We'd like to conclude our argument today by truly emphasizing that we support the FDA's consistent decision to not approve trilopressin here in the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Okay, so we now have the groundwork laid for our, the rebuttal phase of our debate tonight. So. <clears throat> Your colleague, uh, Dr. Ryan Hoff from Advocate Lutheran General, will rebut the pro position. Dr. Hoff? Good evening, everybody. Okay, so as my colleagues from Northwestern described, there is evidence that trilopressin may improve renal function in patients with hepatic renal syndrome. But again, the decision for FDA approval requires both evidence of efficacy and evidence of safety. And they're right, I am concerned about the pulmonary complications and the sepsis and the mortality data. And the risks of pulmonary complications related to trilopressin use are concerning. In the confirmed trial, 11% of the patients with trilopressin died of pulmonary complications by 90 days compared with only 2% of the placebo arm. This is not encouraging data. It is simply not enough to say that because previous studies did not show this as an adverse event, we shouldn't worry, that we should just move forward because gosh, it's probably nothing. In addition, the trial showed a trend towards worse mortality overall at 90 days in the trilopressin group by about 6%. And while this data did not reach statistical significance, the point is that the overall results are not encouraging. I would disagree enthusiastically with the idea that mortality, sepsis, and pulmonary complications are not things that we should worry about just because they weren't primary and secondary outcomes. Now, they also discussed the mitigation strategy to avoid these complications uh, mentioned um, in this trial. The mitigation strategy is fine. It's reasonable. Um, it does add to the complexity of the care of these patients that are already very complicated to take care of. Its ability to be implemented in clinical practice is questionable. Of all of these things with, with, with monitoring the respiratory status, imaging, watching the pulse ox, et cetera, um, there's one step missing, and that is evidence that this mitigation strategy actually works. Really good evidence is something that we don't have right now. Now, it may work. It may work, and if it does, that's great, but we can't move forward just because we expect it to work. Expecting this mitigation strategy to work is not in itself enough to justify FDA approval. Now, Trilopressin has a limited role in taking care of these patients um, you know, in general as we see with the, uh, with the evidence of uh, complications related to ischemia and patients with coronary disease and cardiac arrhythmias, these are all patients that we can't use this in. Any patients that are over the age of 70 years old, in addition to patients with more advanced liver disease, which are really patients we need to be helping. Patients with creatinine over five didn't benefit either. And if you're wondering of all of this, where the FDA stands, I can tell you, they agree with us that this should be rejected. Trilopressin should not be used because they rejected it not once, not twice, but now three times because of a lack of data and concerning safety efficacy. And regarding variceal bleeding, I'm unable to comment since this was not discussed in their argument. Now, hepatorenal syndrome and variceal bleeding, these liver patients are really difficult to treat. 
and they're very sick and we would all love to see more effective treatments coming our way. But that in and of itself is not a reason to approve a medication where the clinical benefit is questionable while the known risks are significant. So I wanna thank you all for your time and thank you for your attention. And again, thank you to American Liver Foundation for the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you, Dr. Ha. Okay, the final rebuttal of the evening. The person with the last word is presented by Dr. Hirsch Roth of Northwestern University. Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to our colleagues at um, Advocate Lutheran General for a wonderful debate so far. Um, but I think it's time to do a little bit of fact checking. Um, a, a big portion of the argument raised against the use of terlopressin by our opponents has centered around uh, the adverse events that have been shown in the trial, the confirmed trial in particular. And I think we just need to remind ourselves of some of the really concrete numbers here and um, the, the mitigation strategy. So if we look at just the placebo group in this trial, the, tri the group that did not receive terlopressin, there was a 90% rate of any adverse event in the placebo group. Of these patients, there was a 60% rate of serious adverse events. And there was a, a almost 50% rate of fatal adverse events in just the placebo group. Actually, if we're talking about numbers, the percentage of fatal adverse events in the two groups, the placebo group and the terlopressin group, were equivalent about 44 and 46%. Certainly, I'm not going to be one to deny that some of the subset of those fatal adverse events, including respiratory events, sepsis, were higher in the patients who received terlopressin. And that's important for us to realize. And that's exactly why trials like these are done. The investigators did a wonderful job of looking into the data a little bit further and creating a very detailed risk mitigation strategy, which includes, as my colleague, Dr. Tulvach, Tulvach mentioned, uh, patients with a serum creatinine of greater than five, these are really, really sick, advanced disease patients who did not actually derive the benefit from telepressin, but were much more likely to derive the negative effects. If you eliminate those patients, as well as patients with acute on chronic liver failure, grade three, of whom really we're just talking about 25 to 30% of the patient population, so not a large majority by any means, you completely eliminate the difference in respiratory events, sepsis events, and this has been published and, and sent back to the FDA by the investigators. And so all those respiratory events and the adverse events that we're worried about were mitigated by eliminating some of these highest risk patients who are also the patients who are the least likely to demonstrate benefit. Let's also talk about the lack of a survival benefit. Again, it's very important for us to know that the FDA helped create the endpoints for this trial because they knew that what we're looking for here are meaningful outcomes in a very sick population of patients. Let's remind ourselves that the patients in the confirmed trial had an average MELD of about 33 and an average creatinine greater than three. HRS aside, patients with this type of disease have about a 50% or more mortality at three months. And we see that in this trial. The mortality is very high in these patients, even in the placebo group. However, that's not to diminish from the meaningful outcomes that have been shown with terlopressin time and time again. It is not, you, we cannot diminish the fact that we're avoiding dialysis in a substantial proportion of these patients, a significantly different proportion of patients who receive terlopressin. And the patients who go on to, to develop, to, to achieve liver transplantation, we're avoiding transplantation in those patients afterwards. We're decreasing length of stay in the ICU. These are again, meaningful outcomes. Not all of our patients with the renal syndrome can make it to transplant. We need to be able to get them other medications that work, and tetralopressin has been demonstrated to do that, in contrast to the medications that my colleagues or our opponent, my, my opponents brought up, which is norepinephrine and midodrine and octreotide. Furthermore, Dr. Shah brought up that norepinephrine costs less. I would really love to see true concrete data, if we're talking about data to, uh, to, to prove that. Um, norepinephrine requires ICU stay. Treatment for HRS requires up to 14 days, potentially. Um, and uh, that's gonna be costly. Um, in terms of liver transplantation, there was no statistical difference in the percentage of patients who went on to receive a liver transplant when they were uh, treated with terlopressin. And even if there were, which there wasn't, um, that's not a reason to withhold a very helpful medication in a substantial proportion of patients. In fact, we can learn from our colleagues outside of the United States where almost all have approved terlopressin as the number one treatment for renal syndrome. And in, in the Italian liver allocation system, where they've actually implemented a strategy such that 
these patients are not deprioritized or disadvantaged because we're treating their complication, but rather that they still receive priority for liver transplantation. Uh, that's, that's, I see the rest of my time. Thank you, Dr. Shroff. Okay, so I'd like to now invite both teams to come on camera and our judges as well, Dr. Loy, Palal, Palai, and Yap, um, to ask questions. I'm gonna leave it to the judges now. Um, I can start, thanks guys. I thought that was really excellent. Um, it is uh, for um, advocate is really hard to argue against a New England Journal paper and Florence Wong, but I think you did a great job. Um, but I do have a question for you. I have a question for each of you. But, um, you know, the adverse uh, pulmonary um, complications from Turlipressin really was due to pulmonary edema and related complications, right? Which could be conceived as a combination of preload and afterload. So can you conceive of ways to mitigate that uh, rather than saying that terlipressin is um, absolutely not useful? And then I'll ask Northwestern question my question. Uh, yes, I think that the mitigation strategy, for example, um, is again, reasonable um, in the sense that if you're, if you're watching patients very closely, if you select patients very um, carefully for who's gonna receive terlipressin, um, then it's, uh, it may be that we find that this is a helpful medication. Um, but I overall, I'm unimpressed with the, the level of evidence that's currently available regarding how, um, how effective this mitigation strategy is. Um, I would like to see some more prospective data uh, that shows us that that um, kind of careful patient selection really works and helps us to both improve kidney function while um, at the same time avoiding some of those poor outcomes. Could I also respond to that? Of course. So I, I would actually make the argument uh, against something that Dr. Hoff had said earlier, where he mentioned that this mitigation strategy was, was unrealistic. I would actually make the argument that the mitigation strategy is much more closely resembling what actual clinical practice is. Um, Clinical practice is very different from these trials that we are conducting right now. In Europe, this has been used for years. And from the meta-analyses that we have, we actually don't see these same adverse events produced in a larger body of literature. So I don't think there were, there's any benefit in doing more prospective studies that only delay the approval of this medication when we already have years of literature already available to us. Okay, excellent. For Northwestern, um, so great that you have a New England Journal publication backing up your position. Um, however, uh, you have to uh, recognize that the creatinine levels were much lower, right, than what we uh, may uh, see in practice and what, what, uh, what we're dealing with in real life. So can you um, tell me a better way to kind of validate this results in the future or propose um, how you would maybe conduct a trial that could help us kind of figure this aspect out? Not a really fair question, but I'm asking. Um, I actually would counter a little bit to that and say that the creatinine levels in, in the confirmed trial were, were, in my opinion, quite high, actually. Um, we're talking about an average creatinine level uh, in these patients of, of over three and a substantial proportion of patients whose creatinine was greater than five. And, and all of us have treated these patients uh, many times over. And we know that, um, catching them earlier on um, uh, is actually going to probably be more beneficial for these patients once they get to creatinines of three, four, or five, um, where uh, we, we're going to have less, less efficacy. And so actually, what, what, the way I take away the results of the New England Journal of Medicine trial, which did show uh, statistical significance for their primary endpoint, is that this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? We have so many other patients who have a baseline creatinine of 0.5 and when they go up to 1.5, you know, um, those are patients who we can make much a much bigger difference on. And uh, I'm not sure that we, we we need more evidence than what we're seeing here with such sick patients who still drive the benefit. All right, I'll ask the next question if that's all right for the advocate group. 
Um, what do you need to see or what do you think should be the next steps um, to prove the safety um, and, and make you more comfortable with an FDA approval of this medication? So I um, understand and I, I heard the, the other team um, talk about the fact that the, uh, the pulmonary complications, for example, has not been borne out by other studies. Um, difficult to ignore though. So um, I think we would need to see it being used in the United States with the mitigation um, uh, in place, the mitigation strategy um, and a prospective trial that shows patients um, do well um, and also um, you know, fare well from a septic standpoint and a pulmonary complication standpoint. Can I just ask a follow-up? Um, why does it need to be done in the United States? Um, a, it could be done in Europe if we had a prospective trial showing that data. I think it would be the most relevant for our patient population if it was done in the U.S., uh, but a prospective you know, trial in Europe would be, um, could, be, could have a role by the, um, by the FDA. Thank you. You're muted, Dr. Yap. Sure. Can you hear me now? Yep. So um, just, just to, um, for the Northwestern side, given this, this drug will be used in primarily not in university settings, but in community settings, which I think most everyone on this call listening is, has dealt with the frustration and, and sadness of dealing with these patients. Do you think there is adequate ways to make sure the mitigation strategy is optimized? So the, the optimal benefits can be provided for this drug. Are you worried about this being implemented in such a large way for so many patients that, that the mitigation strategy might uh, be lost for the urge of using this drug? I can take that. Actually, that's a, I think that's actually a great question. The intent here is to have this very widely available and to be used um, throughout in community centers and, and, and those kinds of places. Um, and I think uh, part of that is just education and working together um, and really understanding the, the, the population here that's at risk. Um, and, uh, you know, the same argument can be made for other medications that may uh, adversely affect, chemo, affect hemodynamics, uh, norepinephrine, those kinds of things. Um, and, uh, you know, the more we kind of use this medication, I think we, we can become more familiar with the risk mitigation strategy, but I'm not necessarily certain that another randomized controlled trial would really uh, be the answer to that question. We clearly know that it has benefit and we just all have to work together to, to remain educated on, on the ways to best use it. I would also add that um, in terms of the, the differences between community and academic hospitals, I feel like one of the things that we've kind of touched on briefly is just the idea that we can use this medication on the floor. We don't have to send patients to the ICU. And that could potentially even be another benefit at some of these other hospitals where ICU beds are even more limited than a large academic center that has plenty of beds to, to spare. So another benefit of a medication like terlipressin. Dr. Shaw, Dr. Huff, you have any comments about that? Um, just kind of going off of those last comments, I'd like to probably say that um, because of the close monitoring that's required when administering terlipressin, I don't know if it's necessarily a wise idea to have these patients on the medical floor and they may actually need ICU admission just because they are at risk for having these severe adverse events. So I don't know if we can necessarily say that um, it will lead to less ICU admissions, maybe length of stay might go down, but uh, initially at least starting the treatment might be a good idea to watch these patients more closely, especially if they are, have underlying cardiopulmonary risk, which the majority of patients, especially with liver disease, end up having. And, and I'll just add one thing again to emphasize, we should just remember the, the rate of fatal adverse events in the placebo group here was, was, was numerically higher than the rate of fatal adverse events in uh, the turtle pressing group. So although we're focusing on the respiratory events, we, we have to consider everything uh, here and these placebo patients are, are in no better shape. Okay, so we want to give the judges some time to deliberate. Um, thank you to these two teams for a fantastic debate. 
you have a poll on your screen, please fill that out. And as we allow time for the judges to deliberate, I wanted to congratulate our teams, all the teams who presented tonight, a stellar group of fellows who presented their positions with great scholarship, poise, and panache, their mentors who gave them valuable guidance along the way, and the judges for their thoughtful deliberations and excellent questions. The ALF tech team, we couldn't have done it without you. You did a phenomenal job. And thank you to the audience for joining us tonight. And I think it's important to remember that tonight we've really showcased a phenomenal group of young up and coming hepatologists. Um, you know, I, I'm very proud of everybody who presented tonight. And I think it's just been an incredible honor to be your moderator. So again, thank you for this opportunity. Um, so I want to one more time um, look at the leaderboard in terms of funding. And in a phenomenal show of Midwestern hospitality, the travel team, University of Nebraska, is now in the lead with $700. So I want to say thank you to the great state of Illinois for showing such wonderful hospitality to your travel team. So I also want to, again, uh, draw your attention to our national sponsors. Um, without their, their sponsorship, we couldn't have had this evening's debate. So again, thank you one more time to Abvi, ASI, Salix, Alexion, Mallinckrodt, and Pfizer, and to our local sponsors, Exalexis, um, Genentech, and Gilead. So again, don't forget the up coming debates. So there's the New England debate on May 18th, 2021. Uh, so if you want to take in more phenomenal scholarship and great young fellows presenting cutting edge data, uh, please join us for that debate. Um, and at this point, we are going to make an announcement um, of the winners. Um, so I am going to give a little bit of time for you guys to fill out this poll, which is really the, um, you know, people's choice award for whoever the audience thought was uh, the winner. So please vote. Um, <clears throat> and I'm still waiting on the judges for the last debate to enter their scores. So think carefully as you vote for the people's choice. Remember that donations, so I hear, are open through the weekend. So you can actually donate to your favorite team, and I would encourage you to do so. I think it's really a wonderful show to these fantastic fellows to support their teams. Uh, remember that the winning team, in terms of donation, gets that coveted cup. So please donate generously. So, now that we are all on screen, let's say thank you again to our fantastic presenters, their mentors, and our wonderful judges. <clears throat> and I am still waiting on that final winner. So, I'm sitting on the edge of my seat here. It was tough. I think you guys all did such a phenomenal job tonight. I have a very hard time being a judge at this evening's debates. So now would be a great time to do a screen capture for you fellows who want to keep this for posterity and uh, remember this evening and all the hard work you put into it and to just remember how proud you made your mentors and, uh, you know, I think a, a lot of good competition goes a long way in, uh, in ensuring a healthy debate and rapport between institutions across our nation and the globe. I think debates are a great way to think about important topics in medicine and also to um, really go back to the literature and give it a critical review. Uh, and the fact that you have the opportunity to do that and that the ALF sponsors these types of debates, I think, really fosters our education, um, not just your education as fellows, but our education as well. So, Tamar, I, I really like to know how Sheila's son voted, because maybe perhaps her son should be the, the tiebreaker. <laughs> perhaps. All right, so I now have the winners for all three debates. 
So I don't have a drum roll, but you can imagine one in your head. The winner of the first debate is Loyola. The winner of the second debate is Rush. And the winner of the third debate, sitting on the edge of your seat now, is Advocate Lutheran. Congratulations to the winning teams. But remember, there is really no right answer to these debates, so congratulations to all the teams. All right. So the, people, the People's Choice Award. So who really was the team that resonated with our audience tonight? It was Rush. So wow, that's amazing. Rush takes home two wins tonight. Remember, the cup, that coveted cup, is still up for grabs, so you should be donating all weekend long. It would be great if everybody who joined tonight could give a little bit to their favorite team. And I want to thank everyone again for coming tonight, for preparing tonight, and for really giving us a wonderful evening. <laughs> so remember that the ALF has a tremendous amount of resources. Please make sure to visit the website. And here are our resources uh, and all the different social media feeds that uh, you can find us on. Um, so again, thank you for coming tonight. And thank you so much for fantastic preparation. <laughs>